well-behaved audience. Thank you. This is really fun for me to welcome everybody back to Old Parkland uh, tonight and to uh, start back up with our debate series. My, my job here is to introduce uh, the lovely Lindsey Craig. I've had the good luck during these last several years to work with Lindsey Craig uh, on, a, on a whole variety of issues, and she's a terrific lady. Lindsey runs the National Review Institute. The National Review Institute is the nonprofit founded in 1991 by William F. Buckley to promote the ideas of a free society that Buckley championed during his long and amazing career. The National Review Magazine, which most everybody knows, is a part of the National Review Institute umbrella. Prior to joining NRI in, 19, in 2016, Lindsay had a 16-year uh, productive uh, time uh, working at the Manhattan Institute, which is a wonderful New York-based think tank. Under her leadership at NRI, the uh, financial footing of the organization has become really good. The programs have expanded tremendously. This program tonight that NRI is putting on uh, is because of Lindsay's, Lindsay's successes. And the whole thing has flourished. So I just want to thank you, Lindsay, for uh, making this program tonight possible and welcome you. And you'll introduce the program. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Harlan, um, and welcome to all of you on behalf of National Review Institute. I'm just really thrilled that we can be back here in this amazing debate chamber. Um, the last time that we were here, uh, which was only in May, although it seems like a lifetime ago, we were hosting a debate with National Review's Charlie Cook and uh, Julian Castro, who were debating whether the Second Amendment covers semi-automatic weapons. I think Charlie won that one, but I was biased. Uh, before that, in January 2020, pre-COVID shutdown, so we were gone for a while, we hosted a debate on individual rights versus states' rights with Alan Dershowitz and Judge Ken Starr, which was an extremely thought-provoking discussion. Tonight's debate will be no different with Mark Zandi and National Review Institute's Kevin Hassett, who is a senior advisor to our new National Review Capital Matters project. I do want to note that we will be back in Dallas very soon, though. October 21st is our annual gala, the William F. Buckley Jr. Prize Dinner. You might have seen these. I know many of you have already signed up, which I'm thrilled about. Harlan is one of our dinner chairs, along with uh, our Dallas-based board member, John Boozer, and our chairman, Peter Travers. Our honorees this year are Leonard Leo and Jean Meyer of the Federalist Society and Adam Meyerson, uh, formerly with the Philanthropy Roundtable. So as we tour this gala around the country, we go to many of the regions that we focus on. And so the last time that we were here for the gala was in 2015. So we're really pleased to be back here and because we have done so much and grown our supporter, supporting group um, over those many years. So if you would like to join, if you have not signed up already and don't want to miss out, um, I highly recommend that you contact me or a member of my team. I'd like to introduce Stephanie Cates over here, uh, who runs uh, the Southwest region for National Review Institute, and she is the best contact for you to sign up and join us. So thank you to all of our old and new friends who have joined us here this evening. I want to make special note of Harlan Crow's terrific team here. You guys are all so great organized, which I really um, appreciate. And uh, you are also very welcoming to us, which is, is heartwarming. So thank you. And a special note of gratitude specifically to Harlan and Kathy Crow Foundation for supporting uh, these debates, but not just the NRI debates, but debate in general. Someone who wants to, yes. <clears throat> to build a chamber like this, you have really honored the American uh, experiment in very inspirational ways. And we all owe you a debt of gratitude for continuing this tradition of civil debate and discourse. 
Uh, I would like to welcome uh, some of the members of our Burke to Buckley class. Uh, the fall course has just begun, and we have many alumni here as well as our 1955 Society members whose philanthropic support allow us to bring you programs like this. And I don't want to leave it out, but very special thanks to my NRI team, because they are the ones who actually put on this program, even though Harlan gave me a lot of credit at the beginning, so thank you. Um, so, as many of you know, as Harlan said, National Review Institute was founded by Bill Buckley as a nonprofit organization to support the editorial mission of the magazine. Our core mission, though, at NRI is to preserve and promote the legacy of William F. Buckley, Jr. And we are directly doing that by supporting some of the top talent at National Review and also building programs to support their work. And we are trying to expand the kinds of programs that we have so that we can bring other aspects of Bill Buckley's legacy to the millions of Americans who, whether they are familiar or not with Bill Buckley's work, they have been touched by the conservative principles that he championed and the movement he spearheaded. The National Review Capital Matters Project is a celebration of capitalism. This new section of nationalreview.com, which features articles on finance, economics, and policy analysis, is, a, is done from a strictly pro-business, pro-free market, pro-capitalism perspective, but in the National Review sensibility. And while there is a lot of, there are a lot of business news sites out there, as you all well know, possibly just the Wall Street Journal editorial page gives you this similar perspective. We think that we are adding to uh, a great contribution to this arena. National Review's online platform reaches over six million readers a month. And with NRI's support, we were able to expand this section, um, adding new content for the National Review audience. The editor of National Review, uh, Capital Matters, is here tonight, Andrew Stutterford. I hope that you get a chance to meet him during the reception. Bill Buckley had a special ability to bring people together. He knew the importance of engaging with those you agree with and those that you don't. He knew that you could look a person in the eye, welcome them with warmth, wit and good cheer, and engage in debate and discussion with respect. This is the National Review tradition, and it is a very important part of Bill Buckley's legacy. National Review Institute aims to engage and persuade our fellow citizens with a with dynamic program like to tonight's debate. After we debate, we have cocktails together because it is important to understand that during the course of the debate, when we're probing on the certain issues to try and persuade, um, to per try and persuade the audience and the other members of the debate that we still respect them for their positions and that we want to learn from them. So I want to thank you all here tonight for participating. It is a very important part of our legacy that we want to then bring to all of you. So thank you. Um, and now what I want to do is introduce our moderator, Colin Clark. <laughs> who will then, I'm sorry, will then uh, also introduce uh, our, um, our debaters. Uh, I think that most of you are familiar with him because he is the director of the Bush Institute SMU Economic Growth Initiative. Um, and he's also an adjunct professor of economics at SMU, where he rather recently fulfilled a lifetime, lifetime goal uh, to earn a PhD in economics. And to that, I say congratulations, because you do not have to do everything in the right order at the right time. Um, before joining the Bush Institute and SMU, Clark uh, worked in the investment industry for over 25 years. I can certainly say that with your background and expertise, we know that our debate discussion will be well moderated. Please join me in welcoming our moderator. Thanks, Lindsay. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Lindsay and Harlan, for inviting me to uh, moderate tonight. I'm honored to be here, and um, thank you. And welcome, everyone, to what I know will be a civil, stimulating, and consequential debate here at Old Parkland. Tonight's speakers will debate the following very timely resolution, quote, ESG investing will undermine America's economy. Now, as most of you all know, ESG investing means investing with the goal of advancing environmental, social, and or governance objectives, and also earning a competitive financial return. 
My job is to introduce our speakers, keep things moving, and get everyone to a reception that will start one hour from now. Each of our speakers will present their case, first Kevin and then Mark, and then face cross-examination from the other side. In about 30 minutes, I'll have a handful of questions, and we will also be collecting questions from you all, and I will present those as best and as fast as I can so that we get through as much as we can tonight. Uh, and in the end, our speakers will have a chance to sum up. So without further ado, I have the honor of introducing our two very knowledgeable and seasoned speakers and offering a few thoughts to tee things up. Arguing in favor of the resolution tonight is Kevin Hassett. Kevin currently serves as Vice President and Managing Director of the Lindsay Group and Distinguishing, Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He served as Chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors in the Trump Administration and before that as Research Director at the American Enterprise Institute, Senior Economist at the Federal Reserve, and Faculty Member at Columbia University. He also served as a Senior Advisor to the Presidential Campaigns of Mitt Romney, John McCain, and my ultimate boss, President George W. Bush. Arguing against the resolution is Mark Zandi. Mark currently serves as chief economist of Moody's Analytics and also as lead director of Reinvestment Fund, one of America's leading community development financial institutions investing in underserved communities. Mark frequently testifies before Congress and is often cited in national news outlets. He's the author of Paying the Price, Ending the Great, Dep the Great Recession and Beginning a New American Century, and Financial Shock, a 360-degree look at the subprime mortgage implosion and how to avoid the next financial crisis. So tonight's debate is timely and important because ESG-focused investment activities are growing really fast today. Bloomberg News reports that total worldwide assets under management in ESG products and portfolios has grown from more or less zero at the, at the turn of the century to roughly $37 trillion today. They project it's on track to reach $50 trillion by 2025, amounting to about one-third of all institutionally managed funds on Earth. Bloomberg further reports that today well over two-thirds of current assets under management are in funds that simply apply exclusionary screens to remove companies with, that score unusually low on various ESG metrics and otherwise are unconstrained. Only a, a very small fraction today uh, of this capital is in funds that intentionally invest in impact projects and themes or ESG projects, though this market segment is growing very fast as well. ESG themes are working their way into, the cor into corporate boardrooms as well, as we've seen in recent statements by the Business Roundtable in favor of stakeholder capitalism and numerous corporate decisions that have been both praised and derided as woke capitalism. So this is an extremely consequential debate because it, it is about the governance and object objectives and future of America's private sector. On the pro side, most papers seem to suggest that ESG portfolios at least don't perform worse by excluding so-called sin stocks. Pressure from ESG investors may be effective in pushing corporations to address long-standing inequities and reduce negative environmental impacts. On the other hand, Hoover Institution economist John Cochran argues that the very point of ESG investing is to raise the cost of capital for offending companies, which is equivalent to raising the expected returns from investing in them. If Cochran is right, ESG investing either has real economic effects and reduces financial returns, for better or for worse, or it has no economic effects and delivers kind of standard returns. So we have two basic questions. One is, is the rise of ESG investing having actual effects, or is it just sort of performative uh, virtue signaling, as some say? Second, if it, is, if it does have real effects, are they good or bad for America's economy? We'll hear first from Kevin Hassett in favor of the resolution, and immediately after from Mark Zandi for the uh, case against the resolution. Kevin, you're up. Thanks. And give you a two-minute warning, OK? <laughs> two minutes. I'll do it. Yeah. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, thank you, Harlan and Kathy, for sponsoring this debate. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, uh, for all the organizing you're doing at National Review. Thank all of you uh, for coming. This is really an amazing room, and it's humbling uh, to be here. And thanks especially uh, to Mark Sandy, my old friend, who's come to talk about a, a tough topic that we're going to disagree about, but you know, I'm sure we're going to have a, a drink together a little later on. Now, Mark's a tough guy to debate. In fact, he's so legendarily tough that, that Harlan had his painting put in the debate room. That's him up there in the top middle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so in 1871, if you took a dollar 
and put it into the S&P 500. I don't even know if there were 500 of them back then. Um, and then you reinvest the dividends. Then today, that money would be worth $56.5 million. So the American economy and the American capitalist engine has delivered amazing prosperity to Americans. Uh, and while that happened, think back to 1871, so much justice uh, came to the United States as well. And so uh, women got the vote, we had the Equal Rights Amendment, Social Security was introduced, we got kind of a welfare state. So a lot of things happened uh, that people and, and government decided that the US should adopt. But all the while, while that was going on, there was no dispute that the key principle of American capitalism was the key foundation of it was the profit maximizing firm. Now, I had a friend once in graduate school that had just gotten a credit card, and his credit card was always at the max, and he was paying like 15% interest. And I said, well, let me pay off your credit card, and you can pay me 10% interest. And he said, no, I can't, because I have to keep it at the max so that my wife doesn't spend all the money. She'll, as soon as I lower it, then she's going to spend more. And I'm thinking, that's really irrational, but as a consumer, you can get, afford to be irrational. You can get away with it in society, because no one's going to really run you out of town for being irrational. But if you're a firm and you're doing something like that, then some other guy's gonna figure out how to reduce his cost of capital, how to be more efficient, and he's gonna compete you out of business. And so when I was in graduate school, I decided I'm not actually gonna study consumers very much. I'm gonna study firms, because consumers can be stupid and they can stay forever, but firms, if they're stupid, then they're gonna be run out of business by people who aren't. And so the market for corporate control has been a key component of uh, the American capitalist system going all the way back to the founding of this country. And, and, and what is the market for control? Well, well, Warren Buffett once said that you should uh, always buy equity in a company uh, that even an idiot could run, uh, because someday an idiot will. <laughs> but when an idiot does, and, and, and what is the idiot doing? What the idiot is doing is he's doing something other than maximizing the value of the firm for shareholders. That's what the idiot does. And when the idiot does it, what happens? Well, uh, people emerge, firms emerge that do it smarter, and they sell the product for cheaper, and they take the market away from them. Or you know, Paul Singer buys the company and fires the CEO. Or some foreign uh, company comes in and takes the market away in the US because they got a product that's uh, cheaper. Now, what is ESG investing? Like, we've already talked about what it is, but ultimately, ESG investing, if it has any substance at all, it means that firms are no longer profit maximizing. So that system that delivered the 57 million for, from a dollar has got to change, and it's because society itself has not delivered enough social justice. We need firms to do it, too. Now, uh, if you think about it, uh, you can ask yourself, well, is this really part of the woke agenda? You had mentioned woke capitalism. And I would assert that it really is that this is a crucial component uh, of the woke uh, capitalism movement. And, and this is something that I wrote about in National Review in our woke capitalism issue a little while ago. Now, why is that? Well, if you look at the political equilibrium in the United States, what's basically happened is that uh, corporations have supported policies where they've given political contributions that uh, support capitalism. And so if there's a politician that's saying, hey, we should have a 90% corporate rate, and they're running against someone, then the corporation usually you know, funds their, their opposition. Or people like Harlan and many other people have funded organizations like the American Enterprise Institute that defend capitalism. But you know, there's a really interesting thing, uh, and there's a Harvard study that looked at this. And the interesting thing is that uh, only about 19% of CEOs of the US are, are Democrat, uh, and uh, the rest are Republican. Uh, and if you look at corporate donations, then it looks like they're very, very lopsided to liberal causes. And the reason is that corporations are worried that if it's clear that they're supporting capitalism, if it's clear that they're free marketeers, uh, that they're gonna get canceled. Uh, by the woke cancel culture. And so we're in this equilibrium where basically there have been a lot of institutions that have developed through uh, corporate donations uh, that have defended capitalism for many, many years. And I believe that the ESG movement is an attempt to basically stop this in its tracks. And so uh, if you look at it, Elizabeth Warren has said that she wants uh, corporations to always list exactly where they're giving their money. They've got two minutes. 
Um, and, and, and so now let's suppose that, that uh, you have to expose everything that you're doing at all times. Uh, then uh, if you do that, then it, that's totally fine. I'm all for transparency. But if you're in a world where everybody's trying to cancel people who support capitalism, then you're exposing yourself as a CEO to extreme risk. Now suppose that there's a firm that's not maximizing profits and it survives. How come? Well, uh, if it survives, then there's really only a few logical possibilities. One is that it's a monopoly, and so it doesn't face competition. Uh, two is that its woke capitalism has uh, lured uh, protection from the government, and so that it doesn't face uh, competition. And, and really, those I'll, I'll stop with those because I'm, I'm down to about two minutes. But those things suggest that ESG is a way, potentially, uh, to protect monopolists. Uh, and so what ESG, the ESG movement is doing, if you're really, really uh, doing well as a monopoly, then you can waste money on stuff and not worry that you're going to go out of business. And so let's actually look at ESG holdings. And so BlackRock's got the biggest firm. Who are their top holdings? Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook. Uh, Vanguard has the same top holdings. And so I, I would ur argue, and if I had more time, I would go into it in more detail, that ESG is really just a way, one, to stop uh, people from funding uh, uh, pro-capitalist uh, uh, organizations and politicians. Two, it's a way for monopolies to hike uh, uh, their anti-competitive practices. Uh, next, it's a way for politicians to extort money for liberal causes. Finally, it's a barrier to entry for firms. And so if you've got to give lots of money to Planned Parenthood, which most firms do, in order to not uh, be smeared and attacked by the, the woke uh, people in government, uh, then you've got to do that before you actually spend money on inputs. And I think that, that finally, uh, woke capitalism and ESG investing is something that, that deviates from really the founding principle of our country. And it's really the first principle, I'll stop now in, in just a second, it's the first principle of economics, that you can do what you want, uh, but you don't distort production. You don't distort uh, the economy if you can help it. And so uh, woke capitalism is trying to get people to change the way they run their firms, to, to do it in a way that doesn't maximize shareholder value, that doesn't maximize profit, and that our society has supported woke causes all the way back to 1871 without firms deviating from those principles. So uh, I urge you to agree that ESG investing will undermine the U.S. economy. Right. And, and Mark, if you want to change yeah. your mind, uh, you're welcome to as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Well, th well thank you, Kevin. And uh, thank you, Harlan and Kathy and Lindsay and uh, Callum for the opportunity to be here. So w am I the guy with the knife or the guy on the floor? Uh, I feel a little like the guy on the floor at the moment. Uh, you know, so, uh, but it's good to be here and a uh, real uh, pleasure and honor uh, to be here as well. Um, let me... Uh, begin by just fleshing out my uh, bio a little bit, uh, just to give you uh, some context. Um, I started my own company back 30 years ago. It wasn't called an analytics firm back then, but uh, it, that would be the popular term for it today, an analytics firm. Economic data, demographic data, financial data, uh, models, analytics, analysis, that kind of thing. Uh, I, it was, I wasn't in a, in a garage, I was in a, in a condo, um, but uh, I remember p punching holes in reports and there's holes all over my bed because I was built right <laughs> doing these reports. Uh, and then I, we grew it into, I, w I did this with my brother and um, a good friend, and we grew it into a pretty good sized small company. Uh, we had 75, 80 people and we sold it to the Moody's Corporation uh, 15 years ago. So that's why I'm part of the Moody's Corporation today. So I've been a small business person, I've been a, well, I've been a startup, I've been a small business person, and I've been now part of the, well, I am the establishment. I mean, Moody's is at the center, well, at least they th we'd like to think we are at the center of the global financial system, so uh, I've seen it all. And uh, I say all that just to make it clear in everyone's mind that uh, I, I am a, a uh, very wholehearted, enthusiastic supporter of the American market system. I think it works, and it works very well. And um, it, be very careful to monkey with it, because it has created a lot of wealth uh, and uh, prosperity, and uh, it's been very important. Um, so with that one as backdrop, I do want to level, level set one other way. I, want, I just want to define ESG a little bit more uh, granularly, just so people understand what this is. Uh, the E 
that's pretty easy. That's the environment. And you know, there's a lot of moving parts there. But in the current kind of context, it's mostly about climate change. I think that's fair to say. It's mostly around you know, efforts by companies to adapt and adjust and mitigate climate risk. The S, the social, uh, that's, that's uh, broad uh, ranging, but it's um, mostly about racial, uh, gender, diversity, equality. Uh, it's about uh, the relationship between companies and their workers. Uh, it's about the people. And the G, the governance, uh, that, that is all, uh, very encompassing, is broadly encompassing as well. Includes everything from um, making sure that uh, companies protect their customers' information and data, which I think is really critical today, to cybersecurity uh, and a range of other factors. So the, the E, S, and the G, uh, when you get right down to it, there's a lot, a lot of good things there that I think we, most of us would agree are you know, pretty good goals you know, that we would want to establish. So that with that as context, let me make three points. Uh, uh, in uh, opposition to the, the, the proposition that ESG investing is, uh, will undermine the American economy. In fact, I, I would argue the precise opposite. I think ESG investing will enhance the American economy. Point number one, um, I think ESG investing is consistent with profit maximization behavior by firms. I very much agree with Kevin that the profit maximization is a principle, a bedrock of the American uh, market-based system. Uh, it's very important. Uh, when you can make money uh, by playing by the rules, uh, magical things happen, uh, magical things. We can solve any problem if you let people you know, uh, have at it and uh, allow them to make money doing it. Uh, ESG investing is about um, making sure that companies are thinking about profit maximization not next quarter, not next year, but in the long run. You know, one of the failings, I think, of the system that we have is that American companies tend to be very focused on next quarter's income statement. And again, I can attest to this as a person who is in a very large corporation that does this is a publicly traded company. Oh, by the way, I'm on the board of another company, a publicly traded company too, so I can see firsthand exactly the pressure the companies are under to, uh, to operate under a short-term basis. Short-termism is a problem, and this, the idea here is that we need companies to think longer run, that the ES and the G are critical to long-term profit maximization. By the way, just as a tangential point, in a low interest rate environment, and we've been in a low interest rate environment now since the financial crisis over a decade ago, and we still are, 10-year treasury bond today traded at 1.3%. In that world, uh, thinking long run makes a lot of economic sense, right? Because if you have high interest rates, high discount rate, you know, you're not gonna, uh, you're gonna discount uh, future benefits from the ESG cost today, and you're not gonna do it. But if you uh, have a low interest rate, a low discount rate, you, you have been, you, the benefit is much greater, the benefit in the long run is much greater today, the present value is much higher. So point number one, I'm, I, I agree, profit maximization is important. We just, we wanna be, uh, we want pro profit maximizing firms that are thinking in the long run. Sec second point, uh, ESG investing is uh, very supportive of long-term economic growth. Long-term economic growth is equal to, or long, uh, economists generally measure it by GDP, the value of all the things that we produce. That is uh, equal to labor force growth, post-labor labor, labor force productivity. And ESG supports both labor force growth and productivity. Racial inclusion, racial diversity, gender inclusion, gender diversity, that increases participation rates. One of the problems, differences in the American economy has, one of the problems we have today with tight labor markets is that a female and uh, participation rates, uh, participation rates of people of color are much lower than a white male participation rate. We need to get these folks engaged in the labor force and so we need to be more inclusive in allowing them, that's, that's the S part of ES and G. Climate risk, this is critical to long run productivity growth. I mean, just. Think about what happened in New Orleans when I, Hurricane Ida blew through and knocked out power for three weeks. That goes right to the productivity of the companies that operate in New Orleans. We've got to do something about that. That's the E in the ESG. 
So uh, I would argue that ESG is about lifting long-term economic growth. And finally, third point, ESG investing is here to stay. It, it's, it's a done deal. It's not going away. There's $50 trillion of assets under management in the United States of America. 18 trillion of those are under, in, under ESG. BlackRock is, in fact, the largest asset manager on the planet and has embraced ESG. And so if you do not embrace ESG, your company's stock price will suffer, your cost of capital will be higher, and the result will be your uh, growth prospects diminished and the American economy will be diminished. So it is very important that uh, we fo the companies focus on ESG. It's, it's here, it's here to stay. Thanks very much. Thank so you. why don't you come over here and you have the cross-examination now. Yeah, but we do it sitting, sitting, huh? we do it sitting down, right? Yeah, th thanks, Mark. You know, you know, I think that the Mark's uh, conclusion actually highlights one of the things that I'm most concerned about, because I think that ESG is, first, it's a luxury good that monopolists could afford, but competitive firms can't. And second, that really what it is is a way to basically make firms pursue what the liberal agenda thinks is social justice, and if they don't, punish them by making it taboo to invest in them. And that's a fundamentally different society, I think, uh, this is a question for you eventually, by the okay. way. That's a fundamentally different society than the one that I, I grew up in, but it's one that, that I think is being fed by Moody's. I mean, if you go to Moody's, I just looked at the website about ESG, it says, climate change is the biggest risk multiplier facing the world today. Urgent action is needed that we're controversy <coughs> monitoring for firms, which means that if it looks like maybe, you know, some, some activist group is gonna come start protesting about the firm, then you're gonna warn investors about it, but you're basically giving the activists investors the signal they need to go uh, protest. And you said the ESG, uh, again, this commitment to social justice needs to be integrated into credit ratings even. Now, now my question for you they is- They are, why they do, are in credit yeah, ratings. Yeah, so, so yeah. the question is why, why is it that the firms are the ones that should need to fix climate change? It's, it's like a government policy problem. So if you look at all the big problems of the history of the US, it's like firms profit maximize, and then the government and charitable people, they, they work on our problems. And so, so why are you giving up on government? So why is it the firm's responsibility to do that? No, I'm not giving up on government. Uh, I do think it is government's role to, and it would be desirable if government would set the bright yellow lines uh, for businesses to operate in. In fact, you know, that, that cuts across uh, all regulation. You know, I, as a business person, I could really care less what the regulation is. Just tell me what it is, make it very clear, and please don't change it very often because then I can adjust to it as a business person. So, you know, if the rules of the game are X, I'll do X. If the rules of the game are Y, I'll do a Y. And I, I do think it's the role of government to, to step in. But uh, our governments are dysfunctional. You know, we've seen that very clearly. I don't think that's even a debate. I mean, that's, we can't get even the debt limit passed without, you know, uh, going to the precipice of, you know, catastrophic uh, default. And this is, the other issue is it's a global problem. It's not just a country problem. Some of these problems, ex like climate change, extends beyond. And these companies we're talking about, these publicly traded companies that are subject to ESG investing, are multinational corporations. The Moody's Corporation, you know, is it, a, is it an American company? I'm not sure. I mean, when I get on a Zoom call, I'm talking to people all over the planet all, the, all day long. So this is a company that I don't know what, you know, what does it mean to be an American company? We are a global company. And we have to think about this globally. And so it's on the, I think it is wise for companies that are on a global platform in, in governments that are operating in different ways and some better than others, some completely dysfunctional, that you know, companies self-regulate. I think self-regulation is not a bad thing, it's a good thing, and that's hey, what we're can doing. Can I, I just say that, because I only have a few minutes for questions, that, that really what you just said is that ESG investing is undemocratic, that there are these like, unelected officials on Wall Street, they're gonna tell firms what they need to do, and if they don't pursue that social justice, then you know what, we're here to stay, and we're not gonna invest in you, and your cost of capital is gonna go up, and so, so I don't think that that's power that I wanna give no, it's to, just good to investing. Moody's and the other Wall it's Street It's just folks. good investing. I mean, if a, if a company is, puts their head in the sand and says, I'm not going to worry about climate change, that's a company that probably is not going to succeed. Why? Because, uh, first of all, they're going to be affected by climate, uh, acute physical climate risks. They're going to be affected by uh, chronic physical risks, the, the heat, the, depending on what their, their op operations of their business are. 
but all, almost all companies are going to be affected by government policy. You know, there, there's going to be carbon taxes or some other mitigation efforts, and every company is going to have to adjust to that. And if they don't adjust to it, that's a bad investment. That's a, bad, a company that's not going to see. They're not profit maximizing over the long run. And what ESG investing is about is identifying those companies to make sure that they do, in fact, think about the long run and think about what, what the risks are and how they should mitigate those risks. Okay, so, so but, but am I about out of time that, that I'll just uh, summarize though, that, that like if I take on right now a more costly form of energy, um, or let's just say I use natural gas and then I buy lots of carbon offsets, then I'm going to be like have a worse cost structure than somebody who's using the cheaper form of energy. And what I'm saying is that the only way that's sustainable is if you take that firm and you protect them from competition. And I think that that's what's happening. And I think that it's interesting that the big monopolists that are canceling conservatives and so on are the ones that are leaders of the ESG movement because they're basically buying themselves protection. That's yeah, what I, I mean, think. I actually, I mean, I, I, the, the ESG investing, I think, uh, is, is a way to try to address the bad driving out the good, you know, Gresham's law, that, you know, you have some firm that's, you know, willing to, you know, just uh, uh, think so short term, they're not thinking beyond the next quarter and the next year, and they're doing things that are, you know, profit maximizing in the near term, and they're making decisions that other firms are going to have to follow. ESG is making sure that that does not happen, that if, you, if there's a bad apple out there, we're going to identify that bad apple, their cost of capital is going to rise, and it's going to make it more difficult for them to do. Your turn to ask him a question, if you'd like. Yeah, well, uh, it, it, what I, my curiosity uh, is you began, and I think the, pr the, the, the premise of your, uh, of your uh, proposition is prox profit maximization, that this is a key principle of a well-functioning economy, and, and I agree with that. How do you respond to the point I made that ESG is about ensuring that pro profit maximization is longer run? It's not just the next quarter, the next year. Well, I think that, you that, know... That is consistent with profit maximization. Yeah, well, well I, th I think that, that basic, basically, if that's all it, it was, then, you know, if you're basically saying, like Schumpeter, great defender of capitalism, said that uh, he's worried about uh, firms no longer being family-run businesses because publicly traded firms might have too short a horizon. But the great CEOs, and I see some of them in the audience, you know, they take a longer view. And I, I, so I think that you're basically creating a parody of profit maximization. And the bottom line is that if it were just, you know, basically getting ready for a big carbon tax two years from now, then a smart CEO would be doing that without being disciplined by some, you know, thugs on Wall Street. They're going to say, you got to do it my way. And so, and so I don't think that taking the long view is really what ESG is about. What ESG is about is buying protection from people who are going to, like, expose you to uh, controversy. Uh, that could affect your market value by doing things like giving lots of money to Planned Parenthood. Don't, don't you think investors do this all day? They, they knock on the door of the CEO and they say, hey, I want to talk to you about what you're doing. This happens every day in every company in America. And they say, this is, I want you to do this and I want you to do that and I want you to do this. What's the difference between that and saying, I want you to think about climate change because I think that's important for your business in the long run. Long run. I want you to think about racial and uh, gender equality and diversity in your in your, on your board and in your workforce because that's key to making sure that you, know, you have the right people that are, that are in your businesses, that have creative, uh, different ways of thinking about problems, can serve markets that are increasingly diverse because the minority population of the United States is gonna be the majority in 20, 30 years, and we need to think about that, you, Mr. CEO. What's the difference between that and anything else that an investor goes and knocks on? That's all, over, that's, all that's happening here. No, no and, and I wanna make it clear, Mark, that, that as you know, uh, that, you know, I was, I, I am 100% understand climate risk, and I've been, you know, I was in the Pagoo Club that Greg Mankiw founded a long time ago for people who support a carbon tax. I think that governments need to take action. But what I'm saying is that suppose there's some little guy who's a $200 million company, I know that sounds like a lot, who's getting ready to IPO, and then basically people say, well, you know, let's look at your ESG ratings. Well, you know, to get them up, then you're going to have to do this on climate change, and this on, on you know, to that group, and this for Planned Parenthood, and you got to do all these things to to please the liberal groups, because if you don't, then your controversy monitoring uh, alarm is going to go off. And that's what's going on right now. And I, I frankly, am offended. One last question. One last question. Because I'm just really, you know, one thing that uh, being on the uh, MGIC board, this is mm -hmm. the private mortgage insurer, uh, we work, we have, and all publicly traded companies do, work with a firm called ISI. Everyone, anyone know ISI, mm -hmm. Institutional Shareholder? Uh, and they, these guys, 
this is what they do. It's really on governance. They come and they look at the, your governance, they look at your board uh, structure, they look at your the CEO's comp pay. They're re they represent institutional shareholders. They represent BlackRock, they Vanguard, and Fidelity. And they come to you and they say, this is your rating, here's your peer group, and here's you know, how you stack up, and why are you low or why are you high, that kind of thing. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Right. I, you know, I, I think that in the end, what's happening is that these people have a lot of power over firms, and so they're trying to basically impose their political views on firms uh, through what looks almost to me like extortion. So I'm going to ask you each a question here, uh, but also, um, do I understand the audience has some place you can write down questions? Is that, is that right? Why don't we, if we have cards, let's pass them out. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll try to you know, collect them together and uh, ask them as efficiently as possible. But in the meantime, while you're thinking about it, I'm going to ask a couple questions. I'll start with you, Mark, go over to Kevin. Is it an easy question? Yeah. You okay. be the judge. Will the Eagles beat Dallas? No. What, what, <laughs> the answer is no? I'm oh, from Philly. He really okay. knows how to Philly please the audience. Oh, doesn't that, he? <laughs> now you're mad. Now you're mad. <laughs> so so the, the question I want to ask you is, I, I know you argue that in the long term there's lots of opportunities around climate change and so forth, but, but does ESG investing not in some sense, when we exclude part of the investment universe and say we can't invest in it, or tell companies that there are whole types of potentially profitable investments they can't do, does it not necessarily, as I pointed out early on, Cochrane has said, involve some kind of take one for the team, you know, that we really are going to give something up in the way of financial return, we're going to give something up in the way of growth. And, and, if that's, and as, an, as an investor, I'm thinking, well, if that's not the case, is there some just ex extreme inefficiency in the market that investors have not figured out that there's an opportunity to make money by not owning certain kinds of companies? How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. I think there's a, a informational, information asymmetry here, and that's a market failure. Okay. And, you know, for example, credit ratings, which is what Moody's was founded on over 100 years ago and has done fabulously well with, was a very similar kind of problem. They, uh, investors could not figure out what is the credit risk of the company's, in this case, debt that they were investing in, the credit risk of the debt they were investing in. And Moody's, along with S&P, you know, uh, established businesses that, you know, put a framework together, th thought through all the elements of the credit risk, and put a rating together. It's pretty simple. Triple A, double A, single A, B double A, you know, very simple. And uh, that was a rating system. And companies that had a triple A, they got a higher, lower, higher, lower cost of capital. The companies that had a B double A, a higher cost of capital. C, you had a low cost of capital, and it affected your business. And you listened. You listened as a CEO. You said, hey, what can I do to get my rating up, get my, lower my credit risk? No difference here. This is the same principle. You're saying, look, there's, a, there's, there's uh, informational asymmetries out there. I've got to, as an investor, there's a blizzard of information. I can't figure out how to make hide nor hair or tails out of it. How do I compare MGIC versus, you know, Genworth versus, you know, uh, UG versus Radian? How do I do that? How do I do that? And what should I be thinking about doing that? And so the, 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 the idea is that uh, in today's world, when climate change is a real risk, when, we, when racial, s social injustice is, a pro we can see it in our streets. People were rioting in our streets in the summer over racial injustice. This is a problem. This is a very significant problem. Gee, we're worried about, I'm worried, I, I was, um, on uh, talking to my sister about um, vanilla. I, we have a good relationship, I don't know. Vanilla, oh, because she's a, she's, she's a really good cook and it's hard to get vanilla. And there was some debate about where is vanilla produced, right? So we're talking about this and, and then all of a sudden I go to my phone because we're debating it. I put in where is vanilla produced pops up on my phone. That is spooky, that is mm. spooky. So we, privacy is very important. Uh, cyber is very important. So if you're evaluating a company as an investment, don't you want to know? You know, are they prepared? Do they have the information they need? And how do they stack up? You know, this is important. Question for Kevin, and please bring me the cards. I think some people in the middle here have cards. Uh, while Kevin is answering, Kevin, uh, you went back to 1871, the year when you invested the dollar and, mm -hmm. and did so well. Um, so question <laughs> is, um, of course, going back to that time, 
it's, it's, we've always had a lot of political and social contention over profit maximization by firms, right? If you go back to the firms of the late 1800s, they would have had labor practices that we don't allow today, po polluting practices and so on. We've always contended over what, the, what the, the limitations on pure profit maximization are. The ESG movement today, is it not just the latest iteration in a 200-year-old political struggle, uh, and maybe, if anything, maybe a more benign source of force for change than government central planning? No, it, well, I mean, certainly everything's more benign than government central planning, but, but what's going on here is that uh, historically, these very important struggles for things like climate change and racial justice have been fought in the political arena and people have tried things and failed and then lost elections and tried things at work and been rewarded for it. And so what's going on now is that a few big actors are basically trying to impose their liberal point of view on US corporations and throw away the profit maximizing system that has delivered so much prosperity. You know, like Mark almost said it, like so we had riots this summer, so we have to throw away the American system. It's like a parody of what you just said, but it's almost, it's almost true. And so all I'm saying is that the appropriate place to resolve things like climate change is on the public square, uh, not to have really powerful Wall Street guys going to every little firm that wants to IPO and saying, well, you know, if you make Elizabeth Warren happy, then your controversy meter is going to be pretty low. You'll get a better credit rating and you'll have a lower cost of capital. Can I, can I just say, um, it's a bit of an exaggeration that you're coming in and extorting, I think you used the, the word, but that's the kind of the, 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 the uh, uh, what you're implying or inserting. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's not that, uh, you know, because I, I think uh, companies, th these investors are, are smart people. They want high risk adjusted returns. They're not going to give up returns. These are, they're fighting for every basis point. You know, when you look on your statement, they, you know, they're fighting and they look for that return. They're, you know, when you compare the different funds, you're comparing the returns. They know that and you're, they are fighting for every basis point. So they're not going to do something that's going to reduce their returns. There's, it's not going to happen, I assure you. These guys are you know, going to fight over every dollar. So they're doing this because they think this makes for a better business, a better economy, not because it, they're some social agenda. May, may I have a five second response? Sure. So, so just, just like as a logical matter, if you have a profit maximizing firm, they're maximizing profit, right? And so if they do something other than that, then their profit has to go down. That's all. So I've got a few questions for the audience. I'm going to lump them together and take a few liberties here. But uh, is that like a drop the mic moment? Would you call it like that? Is okay. it really for you guys a drop the mic moment? I mean, <laughs> come on. I mean, so, uh, two, two for I'm you sorry, here. What, what do you mean by that? Drop the mic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Drop the mic is it's such a strong statement. Oh, okay. You can hear it in the audience. Oh yeah, case closed. This this is over. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So Kevin, I want to ask two to you because you might want to lump them together. You you do what you want. One is one person says that you've won them over. Okay. Uh, but the question is, what alternative solutions would you suggest to address the actual values and issues that ESG proponents are wishing for? And the and the second question is. Is, is, it, is the time right for some kind of conservative counter uh, ESG in the other direction, as it were? Well, well yeah, I, I think that, that you know, Mark raises some really important positive points about things like, like climate. You know, there's a lot of scientists say it, it really is a big risk. And I think that it's also true that governments have failed to act. And so, you know, I think if Mark and I were running the government, we'd agree on a carbon tax right away because, you know, I, I had a paper where I showed that if you had a carbon tax and let me recycle the revenue, then the economy gets better even if you don't care about climate change. Yeah. And so that there are a lot of things that government has failed to do. But again, I think that I believe in democracy and I believe in free markets. And I think that, you know, we're going to get social justice. Probably everybody in this room has a different view about what social justice uh, should be. But, but where we argue about that is in the public arena in the ballot box and so on. And so having some unelected officials, you know, dic you know sort of establish what the principles are and then try to force them on every employer in America but, is something that, that I'm not but, really But it, Kevin, I mean, one third of all assets under management in the United States of America are in, under ESG funds. Mm -hmm. how, how can that be a small group, a cabal of people telling other people you got to do this? This, this, is, this is, these are American investors. These are you and I. I mean, if you're, you know, this is, this is a wide, and it's growing rapidly. It's growing 15, uh, assets under management are growing 15, 20%. This, this is, 
This is America. This is democracy. This is democracy at work. We are voting. We are voting with our pocketbooks, our money. We're saying, we want this. We want you to think this way. We want you to be, you think about the long run. We want you to think about what it means about your company's prospects, you know, not next year, not two years, but what is it, what's the world going to look like 10, 20, 15, 20 years from now? Mark, let me ask, let's follow that up with an audience question for you. Um, so we're now at 37 trillion and growing fast, as you said. That must be global. It is global. Oh, it is global. Bloomberg okay. News uh, report yeah. on global. Yeah, global. Uh, so it's, it's happening, as you say. Maybe it's, it's irreversible. Uh, is it working? Has it resulted in measurable improvements on climate or other top issues that it's intended to address? I don't know. I don't know. It's so, so new, so early. Uh, we're still trying to figure it out. We're just still even trying to figure out the vocabulary and the nomenclature and figure out how to allay concerns like the ones that uh, Kevin is expressing. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, I think it's in its infancy. You know, it's sim and it's got a, a similar kind of feel to it to me, like, uh, you know, what's organic food? You know, uh, you know, do we want, you know, how do you, how do you figure out what, or, uh, what the criteria are for putting organic on the food that you eat and, you know, what's appropriate or not? So, uh, and that's, that's a work in progress. We're trying to figure that one out. So the answer is, I'm not sure. I don't know yet. We need more data points. But I do think if, if my pre and it, at this point, it's, I, would, I would say it's still very much a premise that if it makes companies think longer run about their businesses and think about the risks over the long term, then yes, that will result in a better, well func more, uh, better functioning economy down the road, yes. Okay, I'm gonna ask you another one. I've got several here. I'm gonna try to combine these in very tightly here. Um, so if we suppose that there are major market failures, there's not enough information, as you say, information asymmetry. There are several questions that in some form or another say, are, are we really talking about trying to move towards a world in which basically a relatively small number of elites decide what the direction of corporate America should be, in a sense, imposing costs on the little guy, the little, the little people, as it were, and, uh, and, and are, is small business uh, kind of um, roadkill in this? Does small business uh, actually, in some sense, get uh, flattened by it? I don't understand that link. Well, in a sense, it really goes back to what Kevin said. Is it, does it become a, a, essentially about protecting the very large who comply and get on the program at the expense of uh, yeah. you know, the less connected? Yeah, I still, I still can't get my mind around the idea that you think this is a, 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 a group of elites deciding you know, what's appropriate or not appropriate. This is American investors. Uh, that's you and I. That's one third of all American U.S. assets are in, in these funds. So we're deciding that you know we think this is important and this is key to long-term economic growth. And these are publicly traded companies. These are big companies. You know that we're talking about. These are you know ESG scores and, and for governments as well. I mean, this, you know, we all invest in municipal debt. Don't you think it's important to know you know which municipalities are most at risk of sea level rise, I mean, and to what degree, and what do they have to do to mitigate that? That's part of the ESG score. That's why Moody's, when they put it into, into the, the credit rating, you know, Miami has a lower score than it otherwise would have because of its sea level rise. In a, in a place like, you know, uh, uh, you know, Sacramento, California, may have a, uh, a lower rating, a higher cost of capital because of the threat of fire. So, you know, that's the information that, you know, is being provided here. So it's not a, I, I still can't get my mind around the thought. And if I, I find it actually fascinating that this is the, the thinking that, that it is a, a small group of people that are deciding things here. This, is, this isn't a small group. This is you and I as investors, all of us, millions of people. Kevin, just very, very quickly, last question here, um, and then I'll let you each sum up very, very briefly. But um, uh, should we think of this as, is, is this different from socialism? I mean, are we, are we, I mean, I know these are just terms, but uh, should we think of this as a different category? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it is in some sense the government trying uh, to like hand off to a powerful elite, you know, regu that's unelected uh, regulation of American firms. Um, but that's like different from socialism, which is the government owning capital. So, so I don't think it's, it's socialism, but, but I do think that it's, it's undemocratic and contrary to basically the American principle that profit maximization is the foundation of a healthy economy. Very brief summing up. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity. Kevin, thank you. Thank you, you know, uh, And I, I will say, when you asked me to do the talk, 
I go, well, why me? Um, you know, why do you want me to do this? And I, and I came into it with an open mind. I mean, Moody's has embraced, you know, a lot of this that you, you read from the website. We have bought a lot of businesses that are in the climate risk area. We just paid $2 billion for a company called RMS that does climate change risk for insurance companies. So, you know, we're engaged, but I had not really thought about it deeply. So I came into it with kind of, you know, a very open mind. Uh, but I'll have to say the more I thought about it, the more convinced I am that I'm against the proposition. <laughs> Kevin. Well, uh, thank you all for uh, having the patience to listen to this. Uh, thank you, Mark, for coming. Uh, and, and you've really, uh, you know, pressed me to think harder about a few things. Um, but you haven't really changed my mind. Uh, and, 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 and I, again, I, I think the, the, the bottom line is that it's appropriate for all of us to pursue what we think is justice and, and social justice and to worry about climate change. Um, but the foundation of an economy is that profit, profit maximization is how we maximize our wealth and our welfare. And I think that um, to maybe summarize your point of view, uh, in a way that is a little different than you did, but, but is like possibly the best argument on your side, uh, is that profit maximization is, you know, includes this, uh, and that uh, profit maximization, like what Kevin calls profit maximization, isn't really. And, and so that, you know, and, and my view is that that could be true, uh, but if it's true, then you're trying to improve something that gave us that 57 million. Um, and doing that by giving you know, people who are mostly supportive of liberal causes the power to tell companies what to do, my guess is that we're going to end up worse off. Well, I would suggest that we've learned tonight that there has always been a great deal of contention over the purposes of the corporation and uh, the rules of the road for American business. We're not going to resolve it uh, anytime uh, real soon. We're going to keep on contending over it. Uh, I do think it's interesting that uh, we found, in some sense, a lot of common ground that, in some sense, market capitalism works, and the issue is how to set the rules that, so that it will work as well as possible. Good point. Um, in any case, uh, terrific to have everyone here. Uh, I think the last, my last job here is to indicate to all of you all that Harlan has invited us all to a reception upstairs, just right that way, uh, and it starts right now. So great, great to have everyone here. Thank you all. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks so much.